So uh, there will be no Reynolds numbers up here. There will be no Freud numbers. There will be, it's not really a naval architecture brief uh, because I'm not sure that I'm entirely qualified to give such a brief. Uh, I'm probably qualified to listen to such a brief. But this is a few different things. It's a part lessons learned. It's part on, I was trying to think before I started, what, when I was a program manager, what did I want from the engineers who were supporting my program? So I'm going to try and communicate that to you. Uh, and it's a little bit of a meditation on, on what I've given my life to, frankly. Uh, I graduated from the United States Naval Academy in 1989, 27 years, give or take, to a couple of months. After I graduated from the Naval Academy, I was privileged to assume command here at Card Rock as the commanding officer, the 37th commanding officer of Card Rock. In the 27 years between the time that I was commissioned at the Naval Academy and I took command at Card Rock, 23 of those 27 years I spent in the DDG-51 program in one way or another, either as part of the wardroom on one of the destroyers, as an officer on one of the ships, or as at a supervisor of shipbuilding where those ships were being built, or in a program office where the ship was being managed, shipbuilding program was being managed, and there the microphone is now cutting on. Uh, or in the Pentagon as an action officer where that program was in my portfolio for us. So in some respect, being part of the program, 23 of 27 years. The other four years is LPD-17, which I love that program too, and I love those ships too. But from a time, I kind of dedicated my life to this. And so part of this is a meditation on what I think that means. Uh, and again, I'm hoping this is very much a dialogue today. There we go. Okay. So when I left the program in the summer of 2016, this is what it looked like. Um, it looks like this today, except if you look at the, if we were to update this for the FY19 budget, there'd be even more ships out there in that future award multi-year, uh, because with the increased uh, money in the FY19 budget for shipbuilding, there's another three or four more ships in that what I have here is a 10-year, but back then we thought, well, maybe we'll have a 10-year, 10 a five-year, 10-ship multi-year. Looks like that could be a, a five-year, 13, 14, who knows, maybe 15-ship multi-year uh, out here. So I could spend a long time talking about this chart, and I will, but I don't want to just talk about the numbers. I want to talk about the program so it sets the stage for what we're going to talk about. The very first DDG-51 was funded by Congress in 1985. Again, to be personal, the year I entered the Naval Academy as a fourth class midshipman. Who here in this room was not yet alive in 1985? Please raise your hands. Right? All right. OK. Who here, and now Jeff will raise his hand, was working on DDG-51 design in 1985? There we go. All right, we got a couple. All right. I know of no program, and this is, I'm a little biased in this, so I'm going to make a statement that is without factual basis, but I'm just going to make an emotional statement. I know of no program in the history of the Navy that benefited more from solid, upfront systems engineering than the DDG-51 program. And its longevity is a testament to that systems engineering. And that systems engineering is more than just what we think of as let's design a ship and do the naval. Because I could, I could point to the entirety of the ship and in the entirety of the ship's scope of operations from the way the birthings were designed in order to be more survivable, in order to be more redundant, from the way the combat system was designed and the requirements there deconstructed, and the survivability, the reliability, the ease of maintenance, to the hull form, to the propulsion system. Everywhere you would look, that ship benefited from great systems engineering and great design. 
It was a disciplined process, and most importantly, it has always had throughout its lifetime from back here in 1985 with, I believe it would have been Perkinson back then, right, with Captain Brian Perkinson managing the program all the way through my successor, Casey Moten, who has it today, the 10 naval officers who have been privileged to lead the DDG-51 program. Throughout all of those, right, good engineering, good systems engineering, disciplined approach to design, a disciplined approach to change has served the program well. Now, I'm going to flip and talk about something that acquisition, that acquisition engineers don't always think about. So let me talk about something that might be outside of your comfort zone, and then we'll get back into your comfort zone. And that is the business and acquisition strategies that the program has employed. One of my, and I throw out aphorisms, catch sayings, one of the things, and you usually know I'm angry when I say this. If I ever say this to you, you're not having a good day, probably. And that is, but I think you guys would be unlikely to say that in this view. But every now and then, back at NAVC, I would say, let's solve the physics problem first, and then we'll solve the business problem. I get a lot of people who, when I was the program manager, would give me really cool ways to buy things that I wasn't sure whether or not they worked. And let me tell you, if you have a really cool and efficient and low-cost way to buy something that doesn't work, that doesn't help you, right? Doesn't, that's, some people point to that and call it acquisition reform. Let's get really good at buying something, and we're not really sure whether or not it works, right? That doesn't help you. Right? I, I want to be really good and really efficient at buying something, but I want to have done the engineering to make sure the thing we buy is going to do the thing we want and do it reliably. Now, one of the things that the program is known for was shifting its acquisition strategies over time as both quantity changed and as the industrial base changed. So back here, 1985 through 1987, you had at least three, and maybe more, maybe more like four, but at least three large shipyards in the United States. I would say by then you had Bath Iron Works, Ingalls, uh, Avondale, and Todd, all of whom could build a 10,000 ton destroyer. So when you went out and said, let's just see, have competition and see who wants to build this, the chance of having a lot of very competitive bids was pretty good. So in here, you had a compete for work strategy. By the early 1990s, you basically, Todd had gone out of business and Avondale had effectively changed their business model to the point that you really couldn't envision them delivering a 10,000 ton combatant. They had become a, an aux, a, a high size, low technology yard by then. So you were down to just two. And if your idea was you wouldn't put either one out of business with all of these, well, you're probably not going to ever have a year where you zero out either of your shipyards. If I know I'm going to get at least one ship, then compete for quantity doesn't really help. In fact, you get something that we called the happy loser. Right? So the happy loser phenomenon is I'm going to build four ships. All right? You're going to be one of my shipyards. Nancy, you will be the other shipyard. Who wants to be the happy loser? Who here is feeling so you'll be the evil person? All right. So Nancy will be the good person here. So she is going to give me an honest bid of what it costs her in that year to build one, two, three, or four ships. And I'll get that as a bid. Right? For the, here's what, if you give me one, it costs two, three, four. Price comes down, because you get quantity, you always write, and you can, your overhead gets laid off more, so it comes down a nice curve. Then there's certain fixed costs. Adrian will be the evil shipyard, the dishonest shipyard. <laughs> Excuse me? It's hard to believe that, right? That's, I remember that. So it's going to be tumble home. Don't say that. <laughs> what he'll say is, hmm, what I'll do is I'm going to bid really high, and I know I'm not going to get more than one of those four ships, but they won't zero me out because they have to keep me in business. 
So I'll get that one ship. I will bid really high. I will underrun it. And because these ships are built on a share line contract, right, so they, we share the overrun, we share the underrun, I'll get a lot on that underrun. And then on the work that I have, I will end up with a very high profit percentage because I'll have my base profit plus what I got on the internet. Now, because if I'm the CEO of that yard, my bonus is not tied to how much work I bring in, but my profit percentage, I'm now very happy, right? Because I'm going to get big bonus and deliver one ship to the Navy. The people who live in Nancy's community are very happy because she's now going to hire enough workers to build three whole ships. However, because she bid honestly to aggressively, those three ships will all carry a smaller profit margin. She might or might not be getting in as much cash, but she's going to be doing lower volume. That in the area, when we used to have, the other thing for this is when we used to have a privately owned shipyards, you could make it up on volume, right? So if I'm the owner, private owner of a shipyard, and it's just Mark Vandroff shipyard, and I build three ships and make $10 million on each ship, and at the end of the year, I have $30 million of profit. Or if I build one ship and make $30 million of profit on the one ship, well, those look like equivalent outcomes to me. But once I've been bought by large publicly traded corporation on Wall Street, stock prices tend to follow not, they follow margin, they don't necessarily follow overall cash. And again, evil CEO here, his bonus is based on his stock price. He loses happy, right? He loses happy, right? And the honest CEO over here now wins but gets punished for winning. So we said, well, that won't work. So let's just open a negotiation with both yards and see if we can get to a fair and reasonable price. You'll notice that only lasted two years, right? <laughs> Didn't work very well. Where's, did I got anyone from O2 who came to this? Any of my friends from O2 came to this? No? Okay, right. So uh, this is how you get contracting officers to quit at NAVC, right? <laughs> so you, you basically, because again, you know you're going to split the work evenly. They know they're getting the work. There's very little motivation to get down to a reasonable price. So when you do this, your contracting officers just have big bullseyes on their walls where they bang their heads. Right, so we didn't like that. So then we get this really, this was called competition for profit or pro, profit related to offer. So now, you still my two CEOs here? Okay. Sure. So now, I'm gonna say ahead of time, right, both of you are gonna get three, I got six ships, both of you are gonna get three of them. You're gonna get three ships, you're gonna get three ships. Now we don't have to argue about quantity. You're gonna give me a number, not at price, but at cost. You're going to give me a number at cost. You're going to give me a number at cost. Whoever's lower, I go and I say, you are the low cost bidder. That's great. I have big profit margin to get to the price. So I'm going to put a big margin on top of your bid cost. Mm -hmm. Right? And there, here's your price. And if you overrun it, we're going to share. And if you underrun it, we're going to share. You're the high cost guy. Right? I'm going to deduct a percentage of however much you were higher than her out of your profit. And here you are now with puny profit in your cost. Go build the ships. And oh, by the way, screw you. Right? That's, now that's, <laughs> I love having Adrian as my straight man here. So that worked out really well for the Navy. The Navy loved that. Uh, industry learned to live with it. So, and then we loved it so much that we did it five years at a time in a multi-year procurement, bang and bang. This was back when multi-year procurements were novel. Whoever mentioned Tumble Home, right, in here, the Navy said, well, we're done with the program. Let's go build something else. I will not be critical of the DDG-1000 program per se, but what I will say is this. Requirements change. When we were building, getting ready, and you got to think, this is when we were starting to build the 1000s, the requirements for them are being set in here in the late 90s and early aughts. The vision for destroyers was land attack. I want surface strike. In fact, the very first PEO that housed the Zumwalt, pro, what was now the Zumwalt program, but what was then 
SC21 to DD21 to DDX to now DDG1000. Remember, it was called PEO Surface Strike. That was the first name of it before the great PEO realignment of 2003. So then we get to the late 2000s, and what is our vision for surface, why are we building large surface combatants? That was not a rhetorical question. Someone should shout out an answer. Why do we build, why is the Navy investing several billion dollars a year in large surface combatants? Protect a carrier from what? Air, air, air missiles and what else? Uh, eh, eh, and and. Eh. Submarines a little bit. Usually you're going to have your submarines take on the other guy's submarines, right? Not only when you say missiles, not just the air breathers, BMD, right? And not just the carrier, but other critical joint and maritime forces, high value units. That's what, that now is assigned to your large surface combatant. So the question is, is a DDG-1000 a good hull to do ballistic missile defense from? Well, if you're doing that, your need for stealth goes way down. So, and the people here know as well or better than me, how much, in this room, how much time, talent, and money here have people invested in making the Zumwalt hull reducing its signatures across all the signatures that we care about, right? All right, raise your hand if you were involved in that effort here, right, one way or another, right? A lot of people have put a lot of effort into reducing that. If that now, it looks like, well, maybe we don't need that if what we're doing is ballistic missile defense. Maybe that's not the most cost of what effective platform to perform that mission. So when the Navy gets through making that decision, they say, well, let's go back to 51s, because that looks like a more cost-effective way of doing that. And then you get a restart, another multi-year procurement, and then the multi-year procurement up here for the Flight 3, which is the Flight 2A with a new radar, which I will get to. So that's kind of the history. But I want to, you know, so the first thing that you think of as an engineer, you're thinking about, oh, wow, how did we put on, so you look at the flights here, how did we add a uh, inherent signals intelligence capability. How did we incorporate an aviation capability? Out here, how did we incorporate the new radar? Those are all engineering challenges. But you gotta remember, there's always two challenges. There's an engineering problem and there's a business problem, and you have to solve them together. And like I said, it's no use solving the business problem if you haven't solved the engineering problem. There we go. I love this slide, too. This is both a business and an engineering slide, and it's a little, bus it's a little bit busy. Um, so here we have, on this axis, the average unit cost in constant dollars. Now, those constant dollars are kind of old, but that was the, originally the program was costed in $87, and I always felt a certain joy in uh, every year when the program, when I would have to submit the selected acquisition records in the SAR, because I got to make O5C go back and recalculate everything in $87, right? Which was of every, so it's interesting to read selected acquisition records reports to Congress that major programs do every year, because you're supposed to give all of your dollars in constant dollars at program initiation. Whenever you had today what we would call a milestone B decision, or back then it was called the Milestone 2 decision. And you go back to that. If you have a Nunn McCurdy breach, you update it to the year of your Nunn McCurdy breach and then have constant dollars for that. For those who don't know what a Nunn McCurdy breach is, it's when your program goes so far over budget that Congress says, I'm going to cancel this if you don't tell me why not to. So there's, there's a law. Uh, the law was written by Senators Nunn and Congressman McCurdy, so it's called a Nunn McCurdy breach. The, um, so if you read the selected acquisition records this year, when they're released, usually in March is when the Pentagon, look at all the different programs and see if any of them have a year of constant dollars that's before 87. I don't think you'll find it. When I looked last year, DDG-51 had the record of the oldest, of the oldest still ac active major acquisition program that hadn't breached. Everyone before us had a Nunn-McCurdy breach 
in the, the, in the middle here that had caused it, or they weren't reporting anymore. I think we are the oldest. So that was, uh, that was quite satisfying. As you see, the ships and where they're bought here in the year that they're bought, this is mostly combat systems capability that we look here. But this is not just combat systems capability, but this is the enhancements to the ship over time. And through good engineering, you can see once you came down, you can, I mean, there's a lot of variation here. And some of it is due to, like, some of this here is due to Katrina happening. But in general, that's a pretty steady, once you get through the initial cost of coming down the learning curve and the cost of your initial design, a pretty steady cost profile for ever increasing capability. That's a pretty good record to have. It means, and you don't get that without good engineering, because it means you have to be disciplined in your change management processes. And you can't be disciplined in your change management process if you don't have engineers that understand the systems engineering behind the systems that you're changing and that you're upgrading. Because if you do that willy-nilly, you don't get a nice constant cost. You get a cost that does this instead of a cost that stays constant over time. So. And I'll get the next slide here eventually. It just seems to be like right, around, right here. around here. Yeah. All right. Oh, oh, back. Okay. So this is one I put this program. I told you this was going to be a meditation. Right? You like this? I usually I put this up when I'm talking to. to doing training for program managers. Let's think about the flow diagram of what a program office does. A program office takes in money. They also take in a requirement. And what they spit out, see, we're on the downstream here, right? Dollars plus tasking. This is us here at a warfare center. Or it could be industry. Sometimes it's academia. What do we get? from our customers generally at NAVC. They give us money, and they give us tasking, and we return to them. The money will be spent when we're done, and we give them a product based on that money and that tasking. We give them the design for a propulsor. We give them a report. We give them a, a preliminary design. We give them a report on the safety of one of their courses of action, whether or not. So we give them a product. They give us money and tasking. The program office's job is to make sure that all of the money and all of the tasking, when it adds up, we add up this task and that task and that task, that when you add them all up and put them together, it meets this requirement and spends that money, hopefully that amount or less. That's a successful program office. So when you have a program office as a customer, you should keep this in mind. You should keep in mind, I have some money from them and I have some tasking. And you should think, how does my tasking go in with all the other taskings that program is putting out there so that when we add all of that tasking up, it meets this requirement? So I mean, right now, we think I'm um, just, you know, because it's a big card rock project right now. Anyone here working on Columbia propulsors? Right? Other than Mike, right? Who, do I have any, uh, I don't have, a, they must all be out in Memphis right now, right? Right, so, right, so, right, who's, that's, I can tell you a lot of card rock is working on Columbia propulsors. Now, do we build Columbia class, are we going to build Columbia class submarines in order to have really cool propulsors? No, that's not what the, it's not what the submarine is for. The submarine is for nuclear deterrence. Survivable nuclear deterrence is why we're going to have a Columbia-class submarine. But it can't do survivable nuclear deterrence without that propulsor. And our colleagues in Philadelphia, who are going to, in the foundry, who are going to make that propulsor, can't do it without our intellectual products to guide them. So our tasking right, ends up helping fulfill this requirement. But obviously in a complicated program, I have three arrows coming out here, right, 
in a DDG-51 or a Virginia-class submarine, there are countless arrows coming out of there, but this is the way to think about it. And this is, for your program office customers, this is what they're doing. They're making decisions, or getting decisions made, depending on the level, because they might have to go above the outside of that. They're taking in information, and they are turning the money they get in the requirement into money and tasking. That's the flow of a program office. And, you know, I used to, I had one OPNAV colleague one time who wanted to know why he needed me. You know, and I, you know, it's like, you know, Siri, no, he was a you know, resource sponsor. It's like, what do you guys do in the program office? You don't actually build the ship. Oh, that's, that's right, you don't need me at all, right? I am totally irrelevant. I said, I said, you've got, when you get the $3 billion appropriated from Congress, do you know how to turn that money into two destroyers? And he looked at me and he said, no. It's like, well, Interesting, one of us does, right? <laughs> one of us here knows how to take $3 billion, spend it, and at the end, you get two Arleigh Burke-class destroyers, right? That's right, As a, you know, between me and the, the guy from Iowa. So one of us knows that, right? So that's what, you know, that's what a program office does. Right. All right, thank you, Jeff. Yeah, hit the next. There we go. OK. I'm not going to talk much about this, but I like the slide. Total ownership cost, that was a real hot topic. It always is a hot topic. It was the phrase talk was hot a few years ago. I would argue that this is one of those cornerstones of systems engineering that no matter what you call it is always important. If you design something that's so expensive to operate, even if it's free at the front end, it's no good to your customer. So balancing what you pay up front versus what you pay downstream to operate, whatever thing it is that you're, you're creating and instantiating has always been part of systems engineering. A few years ago, we just chose to give it a catchy acronym. And, right? Because what do we do in the, in the Department of Defense? First, we name something. Then we turn the name into an acronym, and then we pronounce the acronym like it's a word, right? So, right. So if we have total ownership cost, right? So that's TOC, and then we start calling it TOC, right? We have to we turn and like it's a word. This is true of a lot of systems engineering, and I put this up there. This is why I included this slide. Uh, and I was I used this first when I was asked to give a a presentation to the Royal Canadian Navy. And actually, at the time, their, their CNO was there, their head of Navy. And they were so the early days of the Canadian Surface Combatant Program. And I was talking to them, and they were interested in what we were doing with TOC. And they wanted a TOC solution. Now, the problem was I was talking to hockey players, and I was using a baseball analogy. <laughs> um, so there was a little bit. And also, I'm not totally unfamiliar with the National Hockey League. Uh, and I was aware that there is a professional hockey team in Montreal that's quite good. And I always thought they were the Montreal Canadiens, right? They're the Canadiens. There in Canada, they call them the Hobbs or the Habs. The Habs, right, which I was unaware of, right? And they kept, this guy was talking about his love for the Habs. And it's like, what is that? And they said, it's a hockey team. It's like, what league? It's like the NHL. It's like, I don't know any team in the NHL that's the Habs. <laughs> It's the Montreal Canadiens. Well, them I've heard of, at least, right? So they come down and play the Capitals every once in a while. Right, I knew that. So, but I said, I used a baseball analogy because I'm an American, right? Talk is a game of a lot of singles. And, and systems engineering, I would urge you, and especially true in ship design, don't look for the one big solution. It doesn't exist, right? There is no, you know, there's nothing, I'm going to do this really cool thing that's never been done before, and it's going to be awesome, and there's going to be cake. No, right? That's a terrible way to think about ship design. I'm going to make it a little better, right? Technology has changed, and we're going to do this now that technology allows us to do this, and it's going to make it a little better. It's going to make it, you know, it's a game of singles. It's really a game of, you get, you get talk, it's a game of let me bunt and run to first and beat out a throw, and then maybe we'll get lucky and steal second, right? And we'll get around to scoring 
when we get around to scoring. You know, we'll, get, we'll do a hit and run. We'll do something. But if you think you're going to take it and knock it out of the ballpark every time, you're going to have a lot of flyouts, right? You're going to spend your time flying out with a very bad batting average. Talk is a game of singles. You look at things like this and you try and work it down one at a time, a little bit at a time, and you never stop. And the key is to get back to, take me back two slides, Jeff. Right, the way you get this is not with any one breakthrough. It's dedicated teams of engineers working those singles throughout the entire production run of an acquisition program. Okay, take me three into the future. Okay, your, fav your favorite slide, my, my O5C friends, favorite slide. I got some ships up here, right? Everyone talks about what do ships cost, and then everyone yells at, not everyone, Right, if I go here, let's see. So where do I have contractor overhead? This right here, right? Because whenever there's, so these are, the numbers are off here to make this not uh, uh, competition, competition sensitive. Uh, and this is a little old now. But even something that is relatively, relatively production intensive, like an LPD, Right, here's the cost of the shipyard labor. And yet, when a, shipyard, when a ship has a cost overrun, the first thing everyone does is go run at the shipyard and say, can you get your labor costs down? It's like, the labor costs don't really account for anything in the ship, right? They really don't account for that much. Even if you doubled this, right, it's not that big of an overall change in the ship, and you're doubling that to a lot, right? Not that I want shipbuilders to do that. What is big is the shipyard overhead, Right, And that depends on, is the shipyard properly loaded? Is it not properly loaded? It's a lot of non-engineering factors. But what is an engineering factor is the stuff. Right, This is the stuff that a shipyard buys to put on their ship. And then the red, these parts up here, is the stuff that the government buys to put on the ship. That is an engineering factor. Right, that's the design. So when you guys are out there doing preliminary design, you are creating the cost of the ship, especially here at Carter Rock if it's not a combatant, right? At a combatant, it's Dahlgren who's responsible for the cost of the ship ultimately, right? So you look here, most of the cost of the ship is the stuff that Dahlgren tells us to put on because they do the combat analysis, you know, system analysis. For us, it's just, it's power, it's cooling, it's all that, and then Dahlgren tells us to put it on. That takes up most of the cost of the ship. But especially for something here like an LLPD, those were our decisions, right? We did the LPD 17 design. Those were our decisions, created all that cost, right? And it had to. You couldn't be for free. You need engines and pumps and valves or the ship won't be able to do its mission. But if you think, you know, what is the systems engineering impact driving cost, right? During the preliminary design, what we tend to do, all of that equipment, right? That's what that's called. And once you've done that, nothing in here about making the shipyard worker build the ship faster and cheaper is going to do anything to this. Now, you can still attack that cost. The program manager can. You can look for creative ways to buy things. You can buy things in bundles. You can buy things across. You know, right now, if I, if I were going to go back to PO ships, my next you know, thing that I would ask him is, you know, I would, I would point out to them that these guys, a couple of programs as an example, these guys just changed what kind of AC plant they were going to use. And for the Flight 3, the DDGs changed what kind of, of AC plant to use. Oh my god, we were smart. We picked the same ones. So for LXR and Flight 3, we actually picked the same AC plants from the same guy. How wonderful is that for commonality? Maybe we should go buy them together, right? We'll give them an order for, you know, give, the, give that vendor, give York a, a, an order for multiple ones instead of each program doing it onesie, twosie. We might be able to get a little quantity discount on that. There's probably a few other things. So, you know, we, okay, we did something smart. Let's take advantage of it, right? So, the, uh, but in any case, this is defined by the systems engineering process. That part, that's a big part, depending on the class, that's a big part of the cost of the ship. How about giving me the next? Okay. Who here ever had to read Aristotle's Ethics? Some people here had went through real school, right? <laughs> right. 
I talk, who here, who have I sworn in as a federal civil servant since I've been the, uh, I do that now to, for all the new employees. Who here has come on recently enough that I administered your oath of office as a federal civil servant? Anyone? You, you've been here? Okay. So you heard my discussion of courage, right? You did. You got to hear that. Okay. I've inflicted it upon, I mean, I, right, I've inflicted it upon more and more new Carter Rock employees. So quick Yes, did you have a question? Yeah. Okay, a quick uh, refresher course for those of you who forgot your classics back in college. Right? Aristotle, he's known for the golden mean. Sometimes we call it an Aristotelian mean. And he believed that virtue existed at the midpoint between two different vices. And the classic one is always courage. So it's used for that. If you have too little courage, then you're a coward. Too much, and you're a lunatic. Right, you're right, right. Too much, and you're a lunatic. Right, you're willing to do any crazy old crazy thing. Well, that's not good either. And coward is good. Courage is that m good middle point. Right, it's the middle point where you're willing to take risks when it's prudent. Which prudence, by the way, is its own virtue. You're willing to take risks when it's prudent, when it means something, when there's some possible return for the risk. Right. So that's that's having courage. It's not running off and doing any old fool thing, but it's not being paralyzed into inaction. I would argue that every good thing about certainly DDG-51 and ships in general, when you're doing that design right, shipbuilding is a good ships are a mean point between two extremes. And I put a couple of examples up there. You want something that's really super survivable? Where are my Code 60 friends here, right? right you want something that's really super survivable? That's great. Let's. Let's take every vital system, let's mount that as, you know, with the best shock mount ever. Let's get the super duper welder out there and let's put that right in the center of the ship and encase it with some really good armor and it'll be super survivable. And we will never modernize that ship at any point in its acquisition life, right? Because it'll cost too much to get to the stuff to pull it out. On the other hand, you want it really reconfigurable? Right? I've seen some really reconfigurable ships, right? The, the Dutch, is it the Dutch or the Danish? They both have the, they both have some reconfigurable. One of them, and I can't remember which one it was, looked like its combat system was an exoskeleton, right? It was kind of, its combat system was on the outside, and in my mind, the first time you take any little bit of battle damage, it's just gonna all fall apart, right? Right, it's all gonna go detach from the ship and go right into the drink, right? I don't want that either, right? Reconfigurable is somewhere in between there. It's, a, it's, it's making the decisions that'll make it survivable enough and still able to be reconfigured and, and upgraded. It is somewhere in the middle there, as is commonality. And again, affordability is always a trade-off between cost and performance. Somewhere between cost and somewhere between the, getting all the performance is an affordable solution. It's a midpoint, and I would argue that any of you who are doing ship design or doing systems engineering to at least take up a little bit, of, find a good translation and read at least a little bit of Aristotle's ethics. I also think that it's interesting, because I can quote this almost from memory. Oh, no, I've got it up there. I don't even have to quote it from memory. That is the very first, that's chapter one, book one of the ethics, the very first line. Every art and every inquiry, you know, if you're really good, and you have excellent Greek skills, which I don't, right? You'll read it in its original ancient Greek. And the, the word here that's translated as technology is actually the Greek word techne, uh, which I think comes into, um, uh, means something along the line of endeavor or plan or something like that. So every art and every inquiry, every action and technology, the way I have it translated there, right, is thought to aim in a good, and then Aristotle starts listing goods, things that are good, and what people do to achieve them. So it's like the reason that we have medicine is so that we can be healthy, right? Medicine produces health. And the reason we study economics is for wealth. And the reason we study strategy is so that we can have victory. So there's some good that everything aims at. And in there, he says, the reason we have shipbuilding is to have a ship. Now, why is shipbuilding in there with Aristotle, why did he list that with health and victory and wealth and all these other things? Why did he include shipbuilding in that? 
And then you think about the society in which Aristotle lived. Right. He lived in a unique, right, a remarkable society for its day. It was a democracy. It was a maritime power. It depended upon maritime power both for its economic prosperity and its security. And it was threatened by land powers that were either military dictatorships, in the case of Sparta, or land powers that had foreign and somewhat bizarre beliefs in the case of Persia. Right? Do we know of any maritime power democracy threatened by land power dictatorships that depend upon shipbuilding and depend upon maritime power for its safety and for its prosperity? Right? This was 2,400 years ago, right? which is why my every people, you know, usually leaders will have reading lists. And I've, if you ask me what to read, I've got all sorts of stuff to read. But I, a lot of my stuff is old because wisdom doesn't change. Right? The human condition doesn't change. Right? Democracies and maritime powers need their navies. Right? And Aristotle understood that, and that's just as relevant to us today. Now, today, the, na the, the United States of America depends upon us to get that part right. So, yes, sir? Great discussion. So, I've been at this game for a while, mm -hmm. and your point about wisdom and where to seek it. So, you know, several charts before, you don't have to wheel back, but. I noticed uh, a sea change. I've been here. I worked in the commercial sector mm -hmm. for shipbuilding and design for a while. So those customers seem to have a really straightforward ability to know exactly what they wanted, um, and that was based on required freight rates most yep. of the time. So it was purely economics driven, but it was a great clarifier. Mm -hmm. I see the way we do requirements for what we need to be either chaotic or haphazard or it's like our personality shifts or something. And the biggest shift I saw was in the 90s, because um, so I started here in 89, um, where suddenly, for some reason, our brain was removed. We no longer had the wisdom we had. This wisdom resided elsewhere. Yep. And the requirement setters weren't coming to us anymore, or we weren't even involved in the process. And we would get or be inflicted upon, depending upon how right. much of a victim you want to be, you'd get the set of requirements that go, who in God's name, name. put this together? And they, well, it's too late to go back and revisit that now. We just have to make this work. So my, my, my continuing quest here is there are a lot of smart people that are throughout this NAVC organization. Mm. They may be pigeonholed all over the place, but that confluence could really help the requirement builders get to a point where we would be a lot more sure and we'd have a lot more of the risk driven out of what winds up being thrust onto industry. And industry never saw a set of requirements they couldn't deal with. You know, right. and, you know, they'll accept whatever you give them. Evil CEO, right. good CEO. <laughs> but that <laughs> honest, but that honest broker of saying. Have you lost your mind right. by requiring this? Seems to be missing. From so, that. so I mean, I think that's exactly what Jason and, and Adrian are doing. Doing right, right. It's helping drive. And maybe we haven't done that for a while, Mike. And maybe you can take it away from here. But we are. But how does that loop get back to that? So we're a part of that. Opt so one of the things I will say, I'll say two things to that. One is. Um, I think there's a recognition of that, and I know that Admiral Drugan drives exactly what you said. He is trying to drive that awareness into the Navy flag officer community and trying to make systems engineering part of the requirements generation. Uh, and I think that uh, set-based design offers us a unique tool to help inform the requirements process. Uh, and I think that that's, we're seeing that. And again, right, I, Adrian and Jason's team, and for all I put Adrian here at the front as my, my straight man, right? But so, the, uh, right, and Jason's in the back, not, not dressed as a pirate today. The, uh, how's the eye doing? Uh, go back to the office tomorrow, tomorrow. Okay, good. So, um, but I will say another thing. Um, I realize this is being taped. I just I don't know where we're going to put this, but I'm going to say something that's at least mildly critical of the way the Pentagon is organized today. Because I'm a fan, being of history, I'm a fan of the old Navy General Board. Um, so 
the um, previous, a retired three-star, but this, he said this, I heard him when he was on, he was on active duty when he said this, made this analogy, uh, Zembrowski uh, was his, is his last name, but I, I heard him say this once and I will quote him, because uh, I think it's a good analogy and it's funny and it's true. Imagine that you're a child and you go to your mom and say, Mom, I need a new bike. And your mom looks at you and says, you know what? You're right. You do need a new bike. And in fact, you're going to have a paper route next year. So you really need a bike that will enable you to ride your paper route. And also, you're going to get to school, but you're taking trumpet lessons too. So in addition to doing the paper route, you also should have a bike where you can have something enough to carry your trumpet around because I'm going to want you to ride your bike to and from your trumpet lessons so that I don't have to take you in the car. And then you say, great, can I have the bike? And the mom says, beats the heck out of me. I don't know if we have any money for it. Go talk to dad. So then you go to dad and say, do we have money for me to have this bike? And dad's like, well, I don't know. We'll think about it. Maybe next year I'll start saving for it now. We'll put away some money and we'll, we'll see, do we, we, do we have it? We'll think about it through. But, uh, and then eventually dad says, okay, I think I've got enough money saved up. We'll pay for some of it now and some of it next year and some of it the year after that. Now I think we've got enough money. You can at least try and get a bike. It's like, great, you're going to go take me to the bike store? It's like, oh, no. Go see Uncle Louie. He knows how to get a good deal on bikes. Uncle Louie will buy the bike for you. That's our defense acquisition system, all right, in which mom, right, is the joint staff. Mom, right, because all the, it's everyone takes their requirements to the joint staff to have the joint staff validate their requirements. Dad is the DOD comptroller and the PB, PBB and E budgeting system. And of course, Uncle Louie is AT&L and the DOD 5000 at your acquisition system because Uncle Louie knows how to get a deal. The problem is mom, dad, and Uncle Louie don't talk to each other. When they do, they talk past each other, and they each make their decisions independent of the decisions the others are making. The child in this case is either, depending on your view, is either the service, it's the Navy or the Air Force or the Army, or it's a COCOM, it's PACOM or UCOM or CENTCOM. It's the, it's the organization that actually needs the capability. That's the situation we have, right? That was deemed, now, before we say, oh, how could we be this stupid? I want you to all realize, of every English-speaking democracy, we have the best acquisition system. The Australians, the Canadians, and the Brits are all envious of us. In Canada, no federal agency in Canada has contracting authority. There is a federal, what's called Canada Works, there is a federal department of contracting under its own cabinet secretary. And if you're part of the federal government in Canada and you need someone to write you a contract, you have to go to another cabinet agency to get them to service you. In Australia, they have what's called CASG. So imagine if you took all of the acquisition authority out of all the services. If the Navy, the Air Force, the Army, couldn't actually buy anything. They still had an operating force. They would give their requirement, go through their equivalent of the joint staff, and then it would go to a civilian joint organization like at &L with PEOs and contracting authority, and they would buy whatever it is you needed to buy and then deliver it back to the service. So the navies in Canada and Australia, where I've gone and talked to them about program management, can't believe how lucky we are. <laughs> right? It's all relative. I'll tell you who has really efficient acquisition, right, are military dictatorships. <laughs> they have really efficient acquisition. They have no problem with worrying about the requirements. They have no problem about funding. They're, now, what's their problem is because of that, right, if I were a major program manager in a military dictatorship, 
Because I would have nothing on all this, I wouldn't have any of this pesky oversight or have to go talk to anyone other than my direct chain of command, all that, then the contract is going to get let to whoever hands me the biggest bag of cash, right? Which is what happens in military dictatorships. You have rampant corruption. In democracies, and especially the English-speaking democracies, but this is also true of non-English. What I said of Australia and, and Canada would be equally true of, for example, the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force, uh, you know, which is a very professional organization and a, and a great partner for us. But their acquisition has similar checks and balances that cause inefficiencies and cause frustration. But I would still argue it's ultimately preferable to doing this for a military dictatorship. So, you somewhat pick your poison, and again, you seek balance, right? Because in the absence of any controls, in the absence of competing stakeholders, what you get is tyranny. If you never have anyone in charge and can't get any decisions through, then you live in chaos. And our goal's got to be to get to that balance of the right amount of oversight, the right amount of, of back and forth. Some of that is inevitable. But that's, you know, that's the system we have. As, as they say in The Godfather, this is the life we've chosen. So, but thanks for the question. Let's go to the next slide. All right, so talk about what the DDG-51 program has become. Here's flight three. Um, so when we got told to do the flight three, right, everyone's smiling here, it was old ship, new radar. That was old ship, new radar. The new radar made us do a lot of things, or made us do a few key things, right? New power system, did a lot of things to move center of gravity around. That's why you get the scantling change. That's why you get the full load displacement enhanced system, move some other things around. New radar, old ship. This is probably, most people would say, is probably it for the DDG-51. But after what's going to be, right, let's go, you know, after you build about 90 of them when it's all said and done, over a course of the first one was appropriated in 85. Right now we're talking about a fit-up that has appropriated DDGs through at least 2022. And my guess is we're going to probably appropriate a Flight 3 in 2025. So that's over 40 years of buying different modifications. That's pretty darn good. Again, if you're a systems engineer, this should be kind of your standard. I want to design a ship that will be affordable today and that perhaps 40 years from now, people can still be buying some version of that and have it still be relevant and still be something that the warfighter needs, still be something that meets their requirements 40 years into the future. Kind of like a B-52. Right. Which, everyone talks about, gosh, we've got to replace the B-52. Now that becomes, the Air Force has its own set of pathologies when it comes to the buying of bombers. Um, and that also becomes a requirements issue. But, you know, the B-52 has been able to perform military useful missions for a very long time. So, let me do one more. And I think, let's see. Um, with that, right, these were the allowances. Let's go one more. I think I've said, all right. So I put this up for program managers. When I talk to program managers, I'm going to mention this, and I think that's my last of, I got lots and lots of stuff at backup, but that's the last of it. So the DDG, while I was there, the DDG-51 program won the Packard Award. So every year, um, Two, the two outstanding programs in DOD get what's called the David Packard Award. Uh, the year that the DDG-51 program won, uh, I went and was actually, I was embarrassed is the wrong word, but I was in awe of the other program, right? The other program was run out of SOCOM, uh, and it was a combat medical program, and it procured these little med kits that a ranger or a seal could be man portable and they could do a very few simple things to someone that was injured on a battlefield and it was saving lives right and left. I mean, it, it would have been fielded, deployed, put together and it was saving lives right and left. 
by the ability to have a minimally trained person provide a few key medical treatments in the way of stopping bleeding and, and, and a few other things to an injured personnel that allowed survival until you get them to a higher echelon of, uh, of, uh, of medical care. And it's like, and so they were reading the citation and uh, uh, Secretary Panetta was Secretary of Defense at the time and you've got the Army Colonel who was the program manager for it and he's getting the certificate and he's shaking. And then it's like, and then I come up and they're gonna read, you know, it's like, what did you do? It's like, yeah, I got some ships built, you know. It was, Seemed small in comparison to what they were doing, but it was, it was still great for the program and the people worked really hard for that. Um, so I was asked to give a talk about the Packard Award and the DDG 51 program and I said, for the program, right, I said, what, what, what would I tell a program manager? I would say, competition helps, right? If you don't have competition, find ways to create competition because ultimately that's the best way to get your price down. That's your best business model. You'll never ever do better than a competitive price. Right? That's there's no you there are other ways to control costs, but nothing is good is as good as a competition between people who are interested in trying to make money. That is the the best business model for the reduction of cost. Then I said for the people, what about the people who are doing this? And this is what the first one is what I want to talk about, you know, or not talk about, but mention it, I think applies your card. People should love the product. Who here comes to James Harrison's uh, lunchtime talks, right? Right? He loves ships, right? He loves ships. You can tell in all the time he spends researching it, he loves ships. That's who you want running a ship design, someone who loves ships that much. I went to DAU, the program manager course, with an Army colonel who ended up as the program manager for the Bradley fighting vehicle. He talked armor morning, noon, and night. I didn't understand a word that he said, <laughs> and I didn't really care, right? But this guy loved tanks. He was in the right job. The Army, got, the Army won with him, right? The Army won. They got the right guy, right? If you want someone to build an armored vehicle, this guy was your guy. He would go, do you realize that somewhere in the D.C. area down in Virginia, there's actually a museum of armor? You did, I didn't realize. He, he would organize the class. He wanted to know who wanted to go on an armor field trip. It's like, <laughs> no, I'm going to play golf this Saturday, right? But, you know, but that's, you know, that's who you want. Um, and I would give up golf to go take a tour of a ship that I thought was really interesting. Treat people well, which is true for any leadership. And the last one, and this one, I've never really been able to, uh, to convince some people about this, but I keep trying. The greatest person who ever lived was clearly Tim Tebow. <laughs> I, there's not a close second. Excuse me? Not, clearly not Herschel Walker. His, his run that year in the Florida-Georgia game is, still scars me. Um, perhaps Emmett Smith, right? I'm a you know, Gator fan, right? But only, only St. Tim led us to the two national championships. So when, during his pro career, someone asked Tim Tebow, what was different between playing football in the pros and playing football in college? And he said, in the pros, scheme matters a lot more. Right. Scheme matters a lot more, what the strategy is. And you, when you think about it, that makes sense because no one gets to the NFL unless they're all checked out. Right? They're all very, very talented, and they're all very well trained at how to be a football player, whatever their position is. No one in the NFL is not extremely talented and extremely well trained. You're not going to find a linebacker playing any team where you have to teach him the basics of tackling. Right? He would not be playing for the NFL. In high school... You don't get, it's all technique. Because one, in high school, you're, you don't really get to recruit your people. You don't get to find your people, right? In high school, you're, you're taking whoever you have and you're trying to train them to do the basics. College, back to Aristotle, is the middle point, right? College, you're worried about getting the right people. Recruiting is a big part. You're still training, and then there's a little scheme in there. And I said, 
For program managers and DOD, you should think of yourself as a college coach. You should not think of yourself as a pro coach and hopefully not as a high school coach. Part of what you're doing is trying to get the right people in the right place. There's kind of a constant training effort and then you should be thinking about what are my strategies for using them. If you spend all your time thinking up cool strategies and you forget to train your contracting officers how to put out an RFP, right, all the cru cruel strategies in the world will not help. So you need to have a blend of all three, which is what they do in the college. A college football coach spends part of his time recruiting, part of his time coaching and training, and then part of his time thinking about, okay, am I going to run the spread? Am I running the triple option? Or you know, what's my strategy here? They have a balance between the three. And I said for a program manager or say one in DOD, think about it as a balance between those three. You want the right people, you got to worry about how to train those people, and then you got to worry about what you're going to do with them. And I said, too many people, I saw too many people at NAVC go straight to the scheme, and it's like, wait a minute, we may not know how to block and tackle. So let's make sure, uh, I, I, you know, we, let's make sure we know how to block and tackle, and then we'll worry about what our strategy is. So with that, thank you very much for giving me a little bit of time to talk about the program I love. <laughs> Do I have any more questions? Anything else? I have one. Sir. Could you describe your most difficult engineering situation that you encountered as a program manager? As a program manager. And also your most difficult acquisition issue. All right. Let me. How long do you have? Yeah. Let me, <laughs> let me try. Can you go back a few slides? Take me. Uh, okay. Go forward a slide. Okay. So. The biggest single engineering challenge I had as a program manager, so this would have been in Flight 3 design, and this took a lot of discipline, was KG Service Life Allowance. And you see it's already there. It's a little less than it was on 112 for the Flight 3. The management of KG Service Life was the biggest technical challenge I had during my time as the DDG 51 program manager. It was a challenge I was very well served both by O5D and by Carterock. But I will tell you, this gets back into balance, I was offered, not so much by Carterock, but by my industry partners, partners, with a lot of stupid things to do to try and fix this. Right? Someone said, let's, let's build more of the ship out of aluminum. And I said, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, and there were other, you know, uh, and then someone said, let's build the flag bags out of aluminum. And you know, it's like, I said, no, we did. I said yes to that. Because I, I decided that if the flag bags cracked and rusted and all that, they, 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 right, they were holding flags, right? And it turns out it, it's high enough up, that piece, that making them out of steel, that's, the flag bags are high enough up, that being on the top of the bridge, that you got a, not a huge, but a little noticeable change in, in KG when you, when you took the flag bags to aluminum. But, you know, when someone said, well, how about the aft uptakes? No, right? That's not, because I don't want that cracking. Um, but... That was a game of singles. It was managed over a lot of time. We did little things to keep trying to get that KG down and down and down and down, or at least hold it where it is. But that was probably my most difficult engineering problem that I managed with the uh, with that. You have a question? Or uh, yeah. Were you able to push the I, the IWS system to reduce weight in any way, shape, or form, or was that a requirement part? Of that? So you would think that I would be. The good news is is that the new radar did have weight requirements. Oh, that's good. The bad news is they were a little fuzzy in some cases because is the chill water piping that goes to the radar budgeted against the ship or the radar that the chill water pipe is going to? And we weren't as clear as we could have been in that. Um, and in the end, yes, yeah, sort of, but AMDR, for all of its goodness, ended up eating Every last, it didn't come in over, but it ended up eating every last ounce of weight margin that it had in its contract. And we kept thinking, oh, we like the design. We think we'll buy back a few tons here and a few tons there. All that. They ended up, in order to get to their meet the performance, they ate up every last ounce of margin that they had. So we tried to incentivize that. That gets back into the business problem. Right, so my friends in IWS2, they had incentivized their bonuses for Raytheon if they could bring the weight down. That was in the contract. So, you know, we, we, we did things to that. The hardest business problem 
uh, that, I'll, that I've had, I think I would have to turn off the camera if I was going to answer. <laughs> it, would, it would deal with dealing with a shipyard, uh, and, and I, would, I don't think I'm, I'm going to answer that in a way that could be recorded for all time. So. <laughs> if you can hang around for maybe 15 minutes, I think maybe some people will have some questions afterwards. Sure. Well, there's one more back there. Captain, you said you think Flight 3 is pretty much it yeah. for uh, that design. Yep. Where do you see the design going for the future? I see it going to whatever Adrian tells me it's going to be. Um, well, thanks. That's right. Um, he's, a he's a man. No pressure, right? Um, you know, I mean, I'll give you the standard answer, and I, it has the fact that I actually believe it. Um, you know, if you wanted to do a one-for-one -one replacement, which is what the DDG-51 was. DDG-51, we were replacing for structure. We started the DDG-51 program because the Charles F. Adams were getting ready to retire. So it was, I have a destroyer, I want a destroyer. I already have this cool thing called Aegis that we invented for the cruisers. Let me put it on a destroyer, and every time I'm going to take away a Charles F. Adams, I'll build an Arleigh Burke, and I'll be happy, right? And that's, that was the, uh, what got us the original 29 ships of the DDG-51 program. And then we went to the Flight 2A because we needed... As spruances were, were being pulled out, we needed flight decks for helicopters, and it, it, it grew from there. But that was the original concept. The next thing after this isn't a, I'm losing on Arleigh Burke, so let me replace it with a, with a destroyer. It's a, let's think about what we want the surface forces to do, and then let's design different things that do what those surface forces need to do whether it's ballistic missile defense, or whether it's reconnaissance, or whether it's anti-piracy, or whatever those things are. Big long list, ASW, you know, a big long list. Let's think about what those things are to do, and then what kind of one thing, several things, some manned, some unmanned, do you need to do those missions that, are, that surface forces are going to need to do in the future? That's, that's the question that hopefully we're going to start trying to help the Navy answer here in the next year to or so. And that's, so I think that the replacement, the next thing from Arleigh Burke won't be a thing. If it's a thing, we would start doing preliminary design on a ship. And we've done a few of those. And, you know, Adrian's got really cool pictures of, well, it could be like this, or it could look like this, or it could look like this. That's kind of only really part of it. The real thing is, what, the real question is, what do you want surface ships to do? And what's the best way to do that? If it becomes a one for one, every time I retire in Arleigh Brook, I need to put something else in service, then what's it going to look like? I'll tell you what it's going to look like. It's going to look like uh, it's going to be a, take a, an Arleigh Brook, marry it to a Zoom Walt, right? The marriage of an Arleigh Brook and a Zoom Walt, right? Take a look at what the kids look like of that particular marriage, and you'll get a ship that looks something like that, right? That would be a one for one. But I don't think that's the final answer. I think that's part of an answer that's going to be a little bit larger and a little bit more broad. So. All right, thank you for your time. Thanks. The next lecture is March 8th. It's Mr. John Levin. He was uh, formerly NAFSI 05U, which is submarine design. He's going to talk about the historical U.S. Navy submarine design. So please attend if you can. All right, thank you. Thank you.